Well, recently I read a story. It was about a pastor who one Sunday morning happened to preach an exceptionally long and exceptionally boring sermon to his congregation. And of course, that has nothing to do with the sermon you're about to hear. So, <laughs> but in any case, the pastor uh, preached this sermon, and it was really so bad that after it was over, uh, most of the people there that day, they just snuck out as uh, quickly and quietly as they can without saying much at all to the pastor. It was a little awkward, but after a while, one man did shake the pastor's hand. And he said, Pastor, that sermon reminded me of the peace and the love of God. And the pastor, of course, was overjoyed to hear this, that at least somebody out there had appreciated his words that day. And so he asked the man, he said, well, he said, no one has ever said anything like that about one of my sermons before. So please tell me uh, specifically what it was that reminded you of the peace and the love of God. The man answered, well, it reminded me of the peace of God because it passed all human understanding. And it reminded me of the love of God because it lasted forever. And so, and so even if I don't get there the same way, I do hope that my words today will remind you of that love of God that endures forever because love is our theme. Love is the theme of today, the, the fourth and final Sunday of Advent. So we just lit uh, the candle of love. Uh, Bill and Rachel did that for us. And of course, this whole week, we remember the greatest gift of love in all of history, which is the gift of God's Son, Jesus, to be our Emmanuel, which means God with us. And as I was thinking about the, the Sunday when we would, we would talk about love, I felt a little bit uh, strange saying that because as Christians, love should be our theme every time we meet. Love should be the theme of our whole lives as believers if you think about it. It's Jesus himself who tells us when he's asked, what are the greatest commandments? Jesus says our whole faith can be boiled down to two words. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the Apostle Paul echoes that. We all remember those familiar words. They're oftentimes used in weddings in 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul says that love is the greatest of all the virtues, and nothing else matters in your life if you don't have love. And then we remember in the words of 1 John, who goes even further, where it says that God is love, and those who abide in God it, it, those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. And there are numerous other scripture passages you could point to, to point to that drive home that theme. And so in other words, love is the heart of who we're called to be. And so it does feel a bit arbitrary to take one Sunday out of the year and say this is the Sunday when we're going to talk about love. But when it comes to love, though, I think my concern is, that, and you may have heard this before, but my concern is with love that it's a word that becomes so overused and that it really does lose all meaning for us. And so we have to be deliberate about reminding ourselves what love is. And we use that word very flippantly because I could say I, d I definitely love the new Star Wars movie, but I don't, I, I, I don't mean the same thing by that as, as when I say that I love my wife or I love my daughter, or I love God. You know, we're using that word in very different ways in those senses. And so love becomes a, 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 a sentimental word, one we just, uh, it comes off our tongues easily, but, but we forget what a profound claim it is to say that God, God, the creator of heaven and earth is love. And so that's why I'm actually thankful for our scripture today, uh, Mary's visit to Elizabeth and the Magnificat and all of that, because it's not one we usually associate with the term love. And in fact, that, that word love doesn't even appear in this reading from the Gospel of Luke. But I would argue that you'd be hard-pressed to find a more powerful picture of what the Bible's actually talking about when it talks about love than what we see in the Virgin Mary's joyous song here. And it's the song that's oftentimes called the Magnificat, which is the Latin of the very first word of that, for, where Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. And in fact, even the Magnificat has become such a familiar passage of Scripture. It's been oftentimes put to music throughout Christian history that it's easy to lose sight of what it's actually saying to us, which when you get right down to it, is a just plain rebellious message in many ways. So this is a song that Mary sings under the power and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And actually, it's a very Jewish hymn because it, if you go back to the Old Testament and you look in the book of 1 Samuel 2, you'll see the song of Hannah, 
the mother of the prophet Samuel. It's very similar to the Magnificat. Mary was clearly basing the, the, the words on that psalm from 1 Samuel 2. But here, Mary is imagining nothing less than her world and our world turned upside down. That's the theme of this song, the Magnificat. Mary sings about God scattering the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. She talks about the rich and powerful being cast down from their perches and the lowly, the poor and the lowly taking their place. She's looking forward to a day when the hungry have enough food to eat and the rich who have hoarded God's creation for themselves are sent away empty. That's what she says here in this song. So if you look at what Mary is actually saying, she sounds like she's a revolutionary from a th an oppressed third world country, really, if you look at this, the kind of thing she's saying here. And she's not really the meek and mild Mary that we oftentimes picture on Christmas cards and sing about in our hymns. And so I think Mary's Magnificat is a challenge. It's a challenge to all of us who like to imagine God's love as just being kind of a fluffy and a sentimental thing, because that's not what it is here. God's love is a call to action on behalf of those who are suffering. God's love is a, is a demand to, to overthrow the world as it is, lord it over just by a few. And God's love demands the creation of a new kingdom where all of God's creatures, everyone made in his image, is treated with dignity and respect. And if that makes us comfortable, uncomfortable, if it's not something we normally associate with the Christmas season and all of that, if we'd rather just think that Christmas is about just the cute barn animals and the little, little drummer boy and all of that, then I think that's because we've forgotten something. We've forgotten what it's like to look at the world through someone like Mary's eyes. Because we need to back, back up and think about who it is who says these words. You know, we have a tendency to truly idealize Mary, to make her this serene and angelic figure wearing this uh, fancy blue cloak. But in the reality of Scripture, she was a teenager. She was a teenage Jewish peasant living in the ancient Middle East. She was very likely illiterate. She lived in a land that had been conquered and occupied by foreigners by the Roman Empire. And the Romans saw Palestine, where Mary lived, as the backwater of their empire in many ways. And even in Palestine, ancient Palestine, ruled over by the Romans, Mary lived in a backwater, a podunk town, even by her own people's standards, the, land of the town of Nazareth. It was looked down upon by the Jews of that day. And so this was a time of injustice. It was a time of oppression. It was the time when the Jews were longing and praying for God to wake up and to, and to set them free at last. And so when Mary looked out at her world, it would have been easy for her to imagine that God was missing in action or that God had given up on his people for good. And when she prayed, she was praying for God to do something about that, to save his people from, our, from their enemies and to bring justice to our world at last. So in other words, Mary, for Mary whose life was a daily struggle just to get by, picturing what God's love might look like in action is a bit different for those of us, including myself, who are relatively comfortable in this world as it is. So for Mary, it would not make sense at all to say that God is love, that we have a loving God, unless God was angry and upset about how his people are being treated, about how the people who are made in his image are being treated in this world. That's why I personally never understand it when people say that they're okay with a God who is loving, but they don't like to picture a God who gets angry or upset. One of my favorite theologians, N.T. Wright, says that if, that if God wasn't angry or upset by some of the things going on in this world that we see, then he wouldn't be loving at all. There would be nothing loving about that God if this wasn't a God who was angry at the way his people are treated. And so I think a loving God who looks down at this world, sees the violence, sees so much of the turmoil going on around us, when God sees our country, which is the richest nation in all of human history, and sees, sees that we still have children who go to bed hungry at night, well, I personally think that that upsets God. God is angry about that. God wants us to act. And so for Mary, it's impossible to believe in a God of love unless you also believe in a God who is determined to shake things up 
a God whose love really is for all people. And so the Magnificat, this song of praise that Mary sings, it's a picture of what God's new world, a world of justice and peace, and yes, love for all people, what that world might look like. And of course, the Magnificat coming right before the Christmas story, the birth of Jesus, it's no more radical than Christmas itself is. Because what does Christmas tell us? What Christmas tells us that of all the ways God could have entered our world, God chose this young, poor, unknown girl in a backwater town to be his mother. And by being born among the poor, being born among the outcasts, God showed how much his ways, how much his values conflict with the world and how we normally live. Because the birth of Jesus says to the powers that be, that those who think they've got it made, it says that God remembers the vulnerable and the mistreated, even if we're willing to forget them. And that's why I heard it said the other day, and I thought this was very interesting when I heard it, that of all the people in the very first Christmas story, perhaps the the one who best understood what was going on was none other than King Herod. Now, you remember King Herod, don't you? He's the, the, the wicked king who was so insecure when he heard that, that a, king, a new king was going to be born, that he had all the, all the uh, little boys in Bethlehem killed because he was trying to stamp out Jesus. But the thing about Herod is, is that he at least understood Jesus' birth as a sign that his days were numbered. He understood that Jesus' birth showed that in the words of the familiar Christmas carol, God is not dead, nor does he sleep. And that the Herods of this world were going to be called to account by God when God acts to save his people. And so Herod knew that Jesus' birth was going to mean some very drastic changes for this world. But the thing that the Herods of this world will never understand is that God came into our world in such a way, such an unexpected way, to show us the way of love. And it's a love so powerful that it refuses to leave us where we are. And that's a message that Herod didn't want to hear because he actually liked the way things were. He wanted to keep the status quo. But I don't know about you, but I tend to agree with Mary, especially when I look at the state of our world, state of our country, violence, drug addiction. I think that our world needs to be shaken up. I think that there's some changes we, we, God needs to make because we have made a mess of it on our own. And this is a world that desperately needs Jesus' love and needs his grace. And so but that kind of change and that kind of love that God calls us to, and that call, God calls us to especially at Christmas, it's not a love that comes naturally to us. And it's a love that should make us uncomfortable. And that's a lesson I, I, I saw powerfully in a book I recently read. It's called um, Accidental Saints. It's by a pastor out in Colorado named Nadia Boltz Weber. Nadia Boltz Weber is a very interesting person. She was a, a former a drug addict and also stand up comedian who actually became a Christian and is now a pastor. She doesn't look like a pastor at all. She has tattoos all over her, a lot of piercings, but she has a very dramatic and a, a powerful church that's in ministry uh, to the addicted, the homeless. And she, in her recent book, she writes very powerfully in a chapter on Christmas of the struggle she had just three years ago to preach on Christmas because that was the Christmas right after that terrible shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School where there was 20 children who were killed and six teachers and all of that. They were were murdered by a gunman uh, named Adam Lanza. She writes in her chapter in her book that what gave her the ability to preach that Christmas was to remember that Jesus was born into a world that was just as hostile to children just as hostile to God's way of love as ours is. And so she said that the slaughter of the innocents in Bethlehem, the slaughter of the children there is not a story we like to remember at Christmas time, but it at least shows us that when God was born as a baby among us, that he came to our world as it actually is, not some sanitized Hallmark card version of the world that we'd like it to be. Jesus became our Emmanuel in the middle of this world as as we really live it shared our struggles and shared our pains. 
But in this chapter on, on Christmas, Nadia Boltz Weber, she writes about how that message of Christmas was almost too much for her to bear that year. Because she realized this when she was planning uh, for her Christmas service um, that year to have a time uh, to remember the victims of Sandy Hook. And her plan was to ring a bell after each one of the names of the victims were read. And there were 26 uh, people who were shot then. She said, so we're going to ring the bell 26 times. But her associate pastor replied back to her and said, don't you mean we should ring it 27 times? At first, Nadia was just confused by that, but then her, her, she, it struck her uh, that her associate was implying that they would have to ring a bell for the shooter, Adam Lanza, who died there at Sandy Hook as well. And at first she said, there is no way we are doing that. But then in the days ahead, the, the, the words of the Christmas story began to gnaw at her heart, and she realized that at that very first Christmas, God chose to enter a time that was just as violent, just as faithless as our own, but if that story teaches us anything, it's that the light of Jesus can never and will never be snuffed out by all the darkness of this world that we see around us. And so the light of Christ is so bright that it shines not only for us, it shines for the King Herods of the world, it shines for the Adam Lanzas around us, which is why Jesus tells us that we're to love and we're to pray for not just our neighbors, those who love us, we're to pray even for our enemies as well. We're to love even our enemies, those who persecute us. And Nadia said that she recognized that if she couldn't speak that truth, that God came to save this whole world, every single one of us, every single person who is made in the image of God, if she couldn't preach that, that message of love, then it, that God loves even the lives we ignore, even those we'd rather see snuffed out, then she had no business being a Christian, let alone a pastor that day. And so with that Christmas service, that, that year they rang the bells for each one of the Sandy Hook victims. And after the 26th bell was rung, Nadia prayed, and in obedience to your command to love the enemy and pray for those who persecute us, Adam Lanza. And the bell was rung for the 27th time. And so that love of Jesus, it is uncomfortable. It is a challenge to us because it wants to make us like God. And, but the thing about Jesus is, the thing we know about his love is that it refuses to force our hand. It doesn't give up on us, but it, doesn't, it refuses to make us love him in return. And so from the beginning, Jesus came into the world in the most inconspicuous, the most vulnerable way. Jesus came as a helpless baby who was born to a poor teenager who could do nothing but dream and pray and sing for a better world. But friends, there is a reason that God came into our world in such a way. And the philosopher Soren Kierkegaard puts it like this. He tells a story about a great prince who ruled a mighty kingdom, and this prince happened to fall in love with a lowly maiden of his kingdom. But he, of course, was afraid to go to her as a prince, wearing all the fancy robes, all the signs of his power, because he knew that if he appeared to her with all those symbols of his power and his majesty, this maiden that he loved might be awed. She'd be struck by his riches, struck by his power, but she would feel that she had no choice but to marry him, no choice but to love him. But this prince of the story didn't want her awe. He wanted her love. And so he took off all of his fancy robes, all of his fancy princely garments, and he instead put on the clothes of a peasant, of a poor man. And then he went to the marketplace where the woman he loved worked, and he got to know her. He wooed her over time, and he went to her not as a prince, but as one of her own people, someone she could recognize and freely love. And it was only when he won her affection and won her love that he revealed who he really was. And so friends, as believers, we know that Jesus is the prince of that story. Jesus is the one who loving each one of us here in this place and beyond, freely gave up the power and the majesty and the glory that were his by rights and was born as a tiny, helpless baby in a manger. And so this Christmas season, it's a time not just, for, not just for looking back and remembering how Jesus came into our world so long ago. It's a time for asking ourselves how we can let his light and his love into our hearts here and now.
how we can love him more fully. So that's why I'd ask, you to, I'd ask you to challenge yourself to pray now at the close of our service for ways you can be the innkeeper and make room for Jesus in your life, in your heart. Maybe that means something like cutting back on how much money you're about to spend this week and instead giving that money to somebody who could use it. Maybe it means making a charitable donation in your loved one's name. Jessica was just telling me the other day about a family whose tradition is to always do, something, to do a good deed together, sponsor a family who needs it, go out to serve together, and they write that down and put it in an envelope and say this is for Jesus' birthday, and they get that out on Christmas morning. What a beautiful way that is to show the true meaning of Christmas. And so we ask ourselves, well, how can I let Jesus in? Maybe it's through serving. Maybe it's through making time for prayer, for meditation, for remembering what the Christmas message means for you. And we ask ourselves now at this time, have we let Jesus' love into our hearts? Can you say with Mary, the Lord's mother, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And when you look at the manger, when you celebrate the baby who was born there, do you realize that it's a sign to you personally how much God loves you, that he would go to any lengths to show you how much he loves you? Friends, we know that that love changes us, and it's the the love that frees us to love others, frees us from our anxieties, frees us to love even our enemies. And so however you keep Christmas this year, I pray that this week finds us ready to welcome Jesus, the baby born into manger, in our hearts once more. May we open ourselves to his light, to his love, and may we know that perfect love of God that casts out all fear. And may we know Jesus as our Emmanuel, as our God with us, now and forevermore. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.